just going to start recording. It is recording. <clears throat> wow, it's going to be a massive file size. It's already like 100 megabytes just from the first it's all right. couple of seconds. So, uh, hey, welcome on into the studio <laughs> for our first episode. And actually, it's not really our, technically it's our, the first published episode, but uh, we've recorded an episode before, which is pretty fun. We've been talking about doing this for a couple of years. We got started mm -hmm. once upon a time with a little phone and just never really uh, put it all the way out there. But it's nice to have you here today. And yeah. uh, so we've been friends now for a couple of years. So this is Dr. Rachel Hamill. And uh, really nice to have you on here. Now, <clears throat> one of my favorite things when I, when I tell people about you or I describe you as I call you a wizard and I call you magical, <laughs> you've got little notifications, people like your wizard Google review, but how about this? Let's start off and, and share, you know, what it is that you uh, do and, and uh, yeah. who you are. Yeah. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's always fun to converse with you and chat and talk about things that sometimes people don't talk about. Um, but yes, I'm uh, Dr. Rachel Hamill, and uh, my, I guess you could say, degree is in chiropractic, but my calling is in so many different things regarding that. So uh, first and foremost, my biggest, uh, I guess you could say, niche, or my focus is on mending and healing the brain. So there's so many different facets that you can do that. Um, there's ways you can work on the environment of the brain, which is, first of all, what I do in my processes. Uh, the second is you can work on chemically balancing the brain and the neurological system in the body. And then uh, third is taking away any mindsets, any mentalities, um, any emotional or spiritual blocks that are blocking a person from ultimately getting freedom in their brain and their thinking and the way that their body works. Uh, so, you know, your brain is your number one asset. So if you, you can't think clearly, if you can't, if you sabotage everything, or if you can't, you know, get out of a pattern like pain, then it really limits someone in the capacity that they can do. So that's kind of all encompassing. It's hard to fully explain what I do, but it all encompasses on just facilitating someone else's own healing by making their body uh, work at a higher, more optimal level. That is, one, that's a lot of information. <laughs> and I kind of want to break it down because, yeah. you know, the first thing you say is I'm, I'm trained as a chiropractor. When most people mm -hmm. hear the word chiropractor, they think of that, like, Rice Krispie sure. cereal, snap, crackle, pop. Yeah, crack and, and neck. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, <clears throat> my own personal experience with you in terms of, I do a, a lot mm -hmm. of stuff. You know, I'm super hard on my body, whether it's yeah. going and bending some things in jujitsu or just running myself into the ground because I love to maximize life. But, you know, you've, uh, there's so much more, I mean, emotions, that's not something you hear a lot of chiropractors talk about, yeah. breaking down mindset and emotions. I, I, there's a term called quantum neurology. Quantum physics. Quantum physics. Yeah. Yeah, so is that where quantum neurology comes from? So t tell me a little bit about uh, just like... It's approach. a little bit different, but I'll kind of tell you. So um, actually in chiropractic history, uh, within the history of our profession, chiropractors actually started treating like the sickest of the sick people. So one of the first chiropractic patients was actually a man that was deaf. And he gained um, his hearing from a chiropractic adjustment. So we kind of started as physicians that would treat so many different cases from mental conditions to pain to whatever. And then fast forward like 20, 30 years, uh, and then insurance came on the front. And when insurance came on the front, then we had to give these diagnoses uh, so that people could be covered by insurance. And unfortunately, when that came about, then we started being labeled as just the spine physicians, um, kind of more just the pain in the back people. Um, but that's not really where our history started from. It started as we, uh, in our being, in our neurology, how God made us, we are designed to heal. And we want to heal. We're always striving to find balance in our body no matter what it is. But you have to have um, sometimes a facilitation to take away something, take any energy of the body that's not allowing it to be able to heal. 
So yes, chiropractic can be powerful for pain and removal of pain, but that's actually not where it started because when the body is more in a state of balance, then it, you can actually give some of that energy for other sections. But when it's so much as energy is depleted versus like an injury or something like that, then there's no way that that energy is going to come and be able to facilitate some other type of healing in their body. So, um, you know, that's kind of the history. Unfortunately, now we are labeled as kind of the pain spine people because that's what we get covered in insurance. That's one reason I actually don't take insurance because I don't want to be limited in what I can provide for someone. Um, but there's so many facets when you start healing someone's neurology and you start taking stuff up there's really no limitations as to how much a person can heal and emotional i mean we're pretty much emotional beings we're just in the physical world so you can say you know how many people go to their normal physician and say oh you know you're stressed this is just due to stress well that's all good and well but what does that mean for someone maybe they can't really meditate and pray they can't calm their mind they can't do other things what resources do they have to be able to facilitate stress? And that's where there's a big gap. And even in my profession, um, like people don't want to go there. And it's like, well, that's fine if that's not part of your calling, but you have to still um, acknowledge that that's there or else you're actually limiting what you can provide for your patient. So and that's not for everyone. Not every physician wants to go into that, but it's such a huge vital part of healing. When you're, you're saying things too that, you know, I know if I walked into a, a big uh, medical facility and started talking to a doctor, they're mm-hmm. usually, you know, most often, I guess there are, there are exceptions, certain, certain practices, they're not going to go, yeah, oh. Yeah, there's some awesome functional medicine doctors for sure. Well, and even yeah. just what you're talking about with like, uh, like you wove God in there and, uh, you know, different facets of, of healing, meditate and praying. A lot of people that even you know start to talk about god they don't say meditate and pray those are two separate things so Mm -hmm. one of my personal favorite things about you over the years getting to know you is that while we have uh arguably very different systems for living life you're you're very open-minded how do you how do you approach that with clients when they come in and you talk about praying or meditating or, or god yeah so it's not um I mean, you know, God leads me for, with the people, but it's not always something that initially someone will come in and, you know, open that door. It's usually, you know, the right timing. And some people, I don't. Um, people want to see results. <laughs> you know that, being in the business world. Yeah. Like, people want results. It doesn't matter what business you're in. <laughs> so when you provide someone with healing in my profession, no matter what it is, um, they're hungry for more. They're hungry for more. Like, how did that happen? How did that go? And, you know, sometimes that is the gateway or the door for me to be able to say, okay, hey, like, yes, we took off some of these layers and some of this is gone, but let's actually get to a deeper root to make sure that doesn't come back or make sure that we're not just kind of skimming the surface and taking away these symptoms and you're in here every week because I don't want to see people every week. Not that I don't love people, but I want them to be empowered to know why their body is functioning that way. What can they do on their own? How can they um, optimize their body to be able to do that on a daily basis? Um, so it's kind of just interweaved in, you know, some of my great mentors said, <laughs> people follow results, like be really good at what you're doing. And that's just what I've done. That's what I've cultivated. I've really crafted my craft. And that tends to open the door for people to have their thoughts and brain expanded as to, oh my gosh, like, I was settling for how I felt, like I was settling for just walking in this pain or this dysfunction or whatever it is. Um, and then I can kind of weave into, you know, praise God, like, you know, he's really well enough facilitates the healing, so. Well, you're saying there too in terms of, uh, you know, I come out of your practice, your office sometimes, literally feeling like a, a different person mm-hmm. that I went in there. So, you know, when people follow results in it, it's chiropractors in general, I, you know, I'll talk to someone and say, oh, she's a chiropractor. And sometimes they're kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, dug so, a big hole. <laughs> yeah. So it's, we put these labels on things as in people and in yeah. general. So 
I, I think it's interesting your backstory to me because I know you have a, a book that you're working on and I do, a few yeah. other things. And so t- tell me a little bit about, uh, I mean, how you got your, your history. Sure. You know, I, I know a lot about it, but I, I'd love to kind of hear you expand on it. Yeah. So, um, you know, as most of us <laughs> alternative doctors, it's usually our own health journey that gets us to where we're at. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was about 19, I uh, came down with a chronic uh, disease, a chronic infection. We didn't know it at that time, but um, I was bedridden for two years, uh, went through the whole Western medicine route trying to find answers, um, got sicker, 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 sicker. And then it was with the help of a chiropractor and a naturopath who actually just started asking deeper questions and it wasn't anything specifically like I had this huge chiropractic moment of oh my gosh this you know adjustment not like when he got his hearing but it was like oh wow you're seeing this in a different way um and you're seeing this in a you're thinking outside the box of what I had and so um at that point you know I started seeing some natural health practitioners a chiropractor and a naturopath and got the right testing to diagnose what I had but then at that point which is how I help guide people now, is a diagnosis is just a diagnosis. Um, That wasn't it. Um, And people take it on. They take on the diagnosis. And unfortunately, that's what I did for many years until I started breaking down limitations there. But um, started seeing natural health providers, started uh, actually starting to rebuild a little bit of myself of what Western medicine was depriving. And that took over a decade to heal some things there. Um, and then I got maybe like about 40% better in how I was feeling. And at that time, um, I was going to go into pre-med, but seeing that side, I was like, I don't want a part of that, but I loved helping people. Um, I loved science. I loved medicine. And so, um, I went back and I got my bachelor's mind you was still really ill, but I knew I got to learn. I got to do something to figure out what else, what are the other parts of this? Cause I've kind of maxed out what is here for me. Um, so when I finished my bachelor's in health science and then I went on to go to chiropractic school and honestly it was first initially for my interest in nutritional stuff Um, but once I got to chiropractic school I met one of my mentors who opened up my mind uh, about the world of craniopathy which is just a fancy word for uh, moving the bones of the head (laughs) the skull bones (laughs) Uh, so he started helping me and I've had so many mentors now, which I'm so thankful for, but he started opening my mind really about brain and neurology. And, um, when you have a diagnosis, you tend to attribute all symptoms to that diagnosis. Like, oh, I have a headache. It must be this. Oh, I'm tired. It must be this. Oh, I have, you know, so he started saying, well, you know, this, this you have learned in school. But then he opened my mind to like so many other facets of that. And when he first started treating me and I started feeling completely different, um, I was like, oh my gosh, this really isn't from my diagnosis. This is from something completely different. And um, how was he treating you exactly? He was doing uh, craniopathy work. So craniopathy is a combination of chiropractic manipulations um, and uh, traditional osteopathy, which is uh, cranial manipulations. So, With, like s- snapping the head around. No, no. Out. Most of the craniopathy work that we do is in the mouth, and okay. it's moving the small micro movements in the mouth to take pressure off of the brain and create a better balance in the environment of the cranial bones. Hey. But it's all connected. So. The reason chiropractic part is so important is because the body talks to one another, everything connects to one another. So if I just treated the head, I might miss some other things that are going on down the line and vice versa. Um, so he, he started opening my mind about that. He started teaching me about emotions and how those were affecting my body. Um, and then I met so many other brilliant people along that journey as far as nutritional stuff that I had no idea about. Um, and that just planted the seed, you know, that planted the seed. I studied under him, uh, for three years. I (laughs) did my time, (laughs) uh, but I learned so much and I kind of took that and ran with it. And I was like, okay, these are the foundations of what I've learned, but how do I make that my own and separate it? But also how do I add onto that and make that better? Because that's always what you want to do with a skill is you want to take a skill 
but you all also want to add on to that and make it better and better and optimally help more people. So when you talk about emotions, mm-hmm. kind of combining, you know, craniopathy and the things you're doing with emotions and the, the mouth manipulation, which I freaking love. <laughs> but I know you say powerful. people don't like the process of it. I think it yeah. feels amazing. Uh, you know, one of the, the things I'm really big on talking to people about health and I think in general is that like hot yoga for me. Mm-hmm. When I go through that, and I know I really push myself, there are moments where I can feel those emotional releases. Sure. Some are, are much powerful, much more powerful than others. Some are, uh, you know, obviously not as powerful. But so how is it that, is that part of what you're talking about? Like emotional release or working through emotions? What do you really mean by that? It can go both ways. So sometimes when there's so many layers with a person, there's no way I would go right into emotional work because <laughs> okay. it's deep. It's deep in there. Yeah. It's, it's hidden. There's layers. But when we start, so if we view the body as an energy system, and we're all energetic, our heart beating, our nervous system firing, if you've ever seen the EKG, it's electric. We're electric. We're energy. Um, and when someone has so much energy deprivation, just say structurally in their body, and we start to free up that energy, guess what starts to happen? Some of those other areas where the energy has not been there to deal with start coming to the surface. Hmm. Because the brain's like, okay, cool. You know, can I you, have... Can I'm, you give me like a, like a practical example? Sure. So uh, someone comes in, and um, I'll give you a couple different examples. So someone comes in and they're, say, struggling with um, headaches. Okay. okay. And I do my thing, I release the body, I get up to the head and we start releasing some of this tension in the head. Okay. They leave my table, they feel light, they feel relaxed, they come back in the next week and they say, man, I don't know what happened, but like, um, people aren't annoying me as much. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not as frustrated uh, with my boss. Um, you know, things just don't really bug me as much. And I'm like, that's awesome because more energy was freed up that was able to like handle that type of situation a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Or what can happen is what I see in a lot of head trauma cases is some of these traumas are very emotional, whether it's an accident or sometimes abuse or, you know, a traumatic accident to the head. And I do cranial work and literally on my table, they just start weeping and emotions start coming out. And it's just a huge, like emotional energy. It's a huge shift and the body. Just, it kind of dumps in a way. And it like, and we call it like an emotional detox where you just dump it out. Um, And so it can kind of go either way, but we actually hold emotions in different areas of our body. Hmm. Um, And that's in so much research. We have so much research of emotions and and how the body functions. Like the liver holds anger and frustration. Uh, The stomach holds anxiety. And so when people get anxious, they say, I have butterflies in my stomach. Um, The lungs hold grief. So you see people like this in grief and sadness. Um, And so... If you miss some of the emotional part, you can end up chasing a symptom forever, and it's never physical, because that's where they're holding something. Hmm. So you're, if I'm hearing this right, you're saying that physical pain, d- distress, physical disease, right, dis-ease, mm-hmm. comes sometimes from an actual event, an emotional event, and by... Yeah. Let's say that, you know, what's the myofascia stuff, like when you break it up and you feel that little like, oh, yeah. it felt good. So when massages your shoulder and you're like, that feels amazing. Yes. That from doing the emotional work and, and essentially breaking that up and freeing it, you can heal physical disease. Yeah. It's an energy chain. It's a shift. And see, I, I feel like if I walked into Johns Hopkins or something like that and said that, they would say... Please get out of here. <laughs> but you practice this every day. Yeah, and I think there's a difference too of um, 
you know, well, first of all, to answer your question, this type of work doesn't make money for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do they market that? You know, they want somebody who's healed, they don't need to come back or? Well, also, how do they market that? That doesn't come in a pill or an injection or a surgery. Yeah. So that's, that's, not, a, that's not a money maker, unfortunately. Um, and there's some wonderful, I don't mean to talk down on Western medicine, there's some really wonderful functional medicine practitioners. And if people are looking for answers, find a functional medicine practitioner who looks at root causes of stuff. But in general, our medical system is set up not for healing people. It's set up to make people and continue to make them feel sick. Well, and that was, that was one of the most surprising things I remember in some of our first meetings mm -hmm. when I first came to see you is I'd been to chiropractors after car accidents before and it was like, all right, here's your prescription yeah. for seeing me three times a week for the sure. next eight months and let's put it on the insurance. And when I was booking with you, it was something like, ah, uh, you know, come back next month or something. I was like, wait, uh, don't you have a business to run? Like, how is that profitable? But it, you're not somebody that, uh, you know, once I left, I felt great for a while. And coming back wasn't really a, yeah. uh, a necessity. It was more of a, a maintenance or even like pre-healing, preventive sure. medicine, I would say. Yeah, every case is different. I mean, obviously we go by the research of how long it takes to br change a brain pattern or to change a pain pattern. We do have that in research and I don't neglect that, but yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, chiropractors have kind of dug that hole. Like, you know, you need to see someone and I've had someone come in and they've had the same symptom uh, for a year and they've seen someone two times a week for a year and I'm just like, what are they doing? That doesn't make sense. Um, so unfortunately in our profession as well, we have to kind of dig ourselves out of that too. But it does take someone who really educates their people. Um, like I want someone to know why they're experiencing this pain and I want to dig up that root and I want them to be responsible for it. I want to help you give you tools, but I also want you to actually know and listen to um, how it's feeling, why it's feeling that way. Like I want to connect them, you know, to that. Um, and so they're not just rushing like, oh my gosh, like this is what's happening. This and nothing gives me more joy than <laughs> when a patient tells me what's going wrong with them. <laughs> they're like, Dr. Hamill, like, uh, yeah, I, you know, or they'll text me or, or they'll message me or they'll email me and they're like, yeah, you know, I have this friend and they're experiencing this and I told them to do this. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> well, and so even that, like I think of being a teenager and I remember going to a, a doctor and describing what I was experiencing and them kind of writing it off. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can imagine like, well, you just, it's really surprising to me. And I've, I've talked to so many people about this that because there are things like hypochondria, Sure. Or folks describing things in a certain way, or maybe seeking prescriptions that doctors, and in some regards, not all of them, are kind of trained to not necessarily take what somebody's saying and go, okay, that's the absolute truth, because sure. there are all these other factors, and uh, so they kind of go on with their own agenda. I had that happen with my with a knee, with a knee injury I had, and the doctor was amazing, the head of this big medical facility, UC Davis, super great guy. And, uh, you know, we go in there and I had a snowboarding accident and I was like, here's what mm -hmm. I think is wrong. But I'm also just very in tune with my sure. body. And, and, uh, and, you know, he suggested an x-ray and I said, I really don't think it's a bone thing. I'm pretty sure it's a tendon thing. And here's, and uh, essentially he let me bypass it and I ended up being like, a, it ended up not getting surgery, like all these things. But his first path was just kind of down this road of here are the steps versus what is this person saying, yeah. matching it up with what I know and, and figuring out the best path forward. So it's, it's really interesting to hear someone who, from a healing perspective, is like, I think listening, that's what I'm hearing, is I think listening oh is really my gosh. important. It, within our culture, within our society, the way we've been raised, as far as the inability for people to think for themselves is so many facets that we're attacked with. So... Um, I tell people one of the biggest like rewards and strengths you can have is actually just listening to your intuition. And, you know, I believe that's God. But it's being more in tune with that intuitive. Like if something stirs in your heart or your gut or your spirit with something they said, listen to that. Don't push it down. 
Um, but I think it's been pushed down in so many different facets, and that's probably a whole other conversation. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really empowering when someone can actually say, no, you know, that, that doesn't really feel right to me, or you know, I trust your expertise, but I'm also going to do my own research. Do your own research, people. Do your own research. Even my patients do a ton of research. I have really intelligent patients. <laughs> you, yeah. Um, and I love it. For you sometimes, oh my right? gosh, but I love to be challenged. <laughs> Cause I, um, I come in there with my list. All right, here's all the research I did. And you're like, ah. <laughs> yeah, there's a part where you have to kind of reel it in because uh, it can get a little excessive. But, uh, um, I mean, it's it's just a beautiful thing to see people free thinking and educating or really diving into the research, especially with this past year, and just diving in and being like, that doesn't really make sense. Let me look at this another way. Um, and so that's that's awesome for me to help people walk that out. Yeah, since you brought that up this past year, what a fascinating time for medicine, for people, for accountability. I mean, we haven't really touched on it Mm -hmm. uh, too much, but what are some things that people, the conversation now, at least from from what I've seen is, and I've I've been traveling all over the last couple of months. Sure. Some people thought it was pretty irresponsible. Some people are totally okay with it. I mean, I went to uh, two weddings in December. Sure. uh, Recently, a funeral, but, uh, Thanksgiving, these things, and, and it, it, across the U.S., different states have been uh, reacting, which is kind of a sad thing because we've known about it for almost a year now. Yeah. They're still reactive versus proactive, but yeah. handling it very differently, and I've had people here, I've, you know, we live near the ocean, very mm-hmm. fortunate, so, you know, I know walking down by the ocean, having tourists be here, and, and some are saying, hey, how am I supposed to behave here? So, mm-hmm. we're almost a year into this, and there's no general consensus and here is what people uh, should be doing can be doing obviously there's the mask topic but just in terms of personal health things like vitamin d or zinc that you you can't get from the sun by the way because there's different types of vitamin d Mm -hmm. so what are some things that that you believe at this point that should just be non-negotiable that people should know should be practicing to keep themselves healthy during these times. Yeah, so I think the first thing that people need to know is um, this definitely exists. It's a virus, okay? But we're made of billions and billions of viruses. Uh, we're made of viruses. We're made of bacteria. We're made of fungal funguses. Um, we're made of some parasites. Like, we're, we're made of a lot of things. And yes, it's newer in the environment, absolutely. But something that actually we're integrally made of and made with, we cannot hide from, okay? So in that sense, we say, okay, so we know that we're made of billions of viruses and we know there's going to be more viruses in the environment. That's just the way the world is. Um, The biggest way someone can help themselves is to make them more adaptable, okay? Because our environment is always changing, not only emotionally, but also toxicity-wise in our environment, radiation and pollution in our food and all that other stuff. So what determines if a person is susceptible to something or not, or severity or not, will determine how well their body can adapt to anything in their environment. So okay? now, and adaptability, and as soon as you say that, I don't think just biologically, but I think mentally, emotionally, kind of all that you're talking about. So what what does that mean to you to be adaptable? So being adaptable means first for an internal environment, you have to make sure that you have all of the building blocks to be able to adapt. So if someone walking into a situation and say they're exposed to a virus um, has a ton of stress at home, uh, works 80 hours a week, mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't eat good quality whole foods and eats a lot of sugar and processed foods. This is America. So you're talking about (laughs) being in America. Those three things, working a lot, home stress life, bad food. I mean, that's the American dream? No. (laughs) No, it's about quality of life. Yeah. You know? Um, You know, there's so many other facets that you can look at. Do they exercise? Do they move their body? Do they get something like chiropractic or, or some alternative care to help make their body more optimal? 
Um, those are things that we look at overall to see how adaptable a person is. And when you're more adaptable, then you don't have as much fear of something like a virus because you know that, I mean, it's out in the environment. It's here, it's gonna be here. And yes, there are definitely people within different communities and elderly and different age groups that are more susceptible like any virus. Um, so really the topic should have been, how do we make people healthy not how do we seclude them and, and make them fearful and fear infections and fear people, fear each other. Mm. My gosh, fear each other. How do we actually instill health in someone so that they can adapt for the next virus or for the, whatever it is? Because we're made to adapt. That's just how our body works. So you didn't hear that very much in the media. You didn't hear that very much in the world this last year as far as how do we keep healthy. Well start changing and making good healthy habits um start changing the way and what you're consuming in your body food can either heal you or it can harm you it can be fuel or it can deplete your fuel um it can be nutritious or it can be toxic um other ways is we have to move our body we now, have to on the nutrition thing i mm -hmm. i, I want to get into the movement too absolutely i know people that drink soda all day long, eat ice cream before dinner, which mm -hmm. I just did the other day with a really <laughs> great group of people. We were waiting to go to sushi, and there was a Cold Stone and Cheesecake place next door. Mm -hmm. And we went in, and I was like, we're getting cheesecake for dinner? This is kind of cool. None of us felt good about it afterwards, <laughs> by the way, but we just kind of did it. But, yes. And they just, they seem to have everything, you know, some folks in particular that can do this, be like machines, and, and appear For what period healthy. of time, though? Ah, well, yeah. In some cases, I think, honestly, decades. They could, but I think one of my passions as well is for, like, millennials and younger generations, because uh -huh. um, I had a different story because I was obviously very ill, very young, and so I had to change a lot of habits. Yeah. But in general, the younger generation you know, they're, they're just living their wild free life and they don't really feel anything because their body's so much better at adapting to things. But you add that on and 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 then they get to this age where stuff just starts kind of crumbling. And it's like, well, okay, but let's look at more longevity of your life because you only have one vehicle, which is your body. And if you didn't take care of that vehicle like you had a car, if you didn't change the oil, if you didn't take care of it, is that vehicle going to last your whole life? If you have one vehicle to last your whole life, how well would you take care of it? You don't want to beat broken down car when you're in your 40s and 50s, and that's unfortunately what happens when there isn't enough focus on, hey, like actually what you're doing now matters. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to get to those goals that you're working so hard for, like you're getting your degree, you're working these long hours, if you want that to like actually be happy <laughs> when you get there, you gotta start thinking and taking care of yourself now. Well, and it, it seems like there's so much diversity in terms of what mm -hmm. is good for someone, may not be good for another person, you know, peanut allergies. That is, seems to be a, a newer phenomena for, for humans in general. It's not yeah. something that really existed a while ago. There's people that talk about, oh, it's the mold, the uh, mitotoxins, I think they're called. Mycotoxins, Mycotoxin, yeah. Mycotoxin, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I remember reading a study, you know, in the last few years out of the UK that you have to go pretty soon too. No, not yet. Okay. I don't think that actually the, um, oh, yeah, it's on. Oh, it's We're on good. the 24-hour clock. Yeah, <laughs> got a little international action going. Nice. <laughs> um, but uh, they, uh, uh basically said they were curing, and I know cure is a strong word, so maybe it's a different word, but basically defeating peanut allergies by injecting these allergens mm -hmm. into children. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, looking at some of these folks that just seem to be machines that are consuming really strong stuff, whereas I know I'm, I'm very sensitive. If I have some soda or things like that, like I can just feel it more in terms of how it impacts my, my brain and my emotions. Sure. So what do you think factors into to an individual, you know, knowing themselves? Or well, just on the outside, too, they may look like a machine and they may be getting stuff done. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily they, I mean they feel as optimal as they could. Mm. 
Um, you know, what does their home look, home life look like? Um, like, are they sleeping through the night? What's their energy? Um, how do they feel about how they look? Or, or yeah. you know, there's so many different factors there that um, just or or someone that's really thin. You know, someone that's really thin doesn't mean they're healthy. Mm-hmm. There's a stigma there. Uh, so you know, there's so many different facets to health, and just because someone gets something done doesn't mean that they're necessarily uh, taking care of their temple mm-hmm. and healing it the way it needs to be healed to actually enjoy once you get to that goal. <laughs> yeah. um, but all that is to say is just, you know, all this past year, it, it hasn't really, there's been a huge gap in the health part of people. And yes, nutrition is one. Yes, getting outside and breathing oxygen is one. You have to breathe. Mass do not promote boring. oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually don't prevent the viruses. Viruses are too small of particles. They pass through the mask. Mm-hmm. So you're basically just breathing in your own mouth bacteria. That's controversial. I'm going to get some kickback for that for sure. But. Uh, you know, so we need oxygen. We need air. Uh, we need natural light. Yeah. Uh, we need our, our eyes and our brain respond to natural light. Get up every morning and just go look at the sun or look oh. at the sky. Um, breathe oxygen uh, we need movement we're meant to move we're, um, and I know this past year we're blessed because a lot of businesses were able to be um, virtual yeah. but that also comes with health limitations um, you're not moving you're not getting outside you're around radiation and technology a lot and so it's, it's everything has to be um, moderation as far as if you're doing that then you're going to ask your body to adapt to that Can it adapt to that? Well, did you give it the building blocks to adapt to that? Another reason. In in movement, you know, I have a a fairly diverse group of people in my life. So some folks can go out and run a marathon. Mm -hmm. And then some, the idea, I mean, I had some people come visit me. And I mean, we just walked down to visit the Seals, which is a mile and a half way. And I didn't think much of it. I'm like, oh, let's just walk down. It's not worth the drive and finding parking. And we get down there and a couple of them were exhausted. So, Mm -hmm. uh... You know how much movement can someone do and, and still kind of get by, or what's necessary? Again, does that come back to more individual diversity? Is it that if I just walked around for ten minutes, that's a big deal? Um, well, everybody has different um, a, a different biochemistry. Uh-huh. So actually, there are different movements. There's actually different types of exercise that stimulate different parts of the brain, which is really interesting. Hmm. Um, so with movement for individuals, um, what I tend to start with people of if they haven't been moving is just move. So what gives you joy when you move? Like, let's just start walking, let's start, you know, whatever it is, uh, lay on your floor and do some kicks with your feet, whatever it is, <laughs> move your butt. Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever it is, um, we just want to start making a goal, okay? Mm-hmm. And so when we start moving, because uh, movement moves around and gets so much stuff out of our body, it increases the endorphins, it increases something called brain-derived neurotropic factor in our brain. Lots of big oh, benefits big for the brain, okay? <laughs> um, but exercise also can be depleting. So like mm-hmm. someone that's a, um, a, a fitness like addict, mm-hmm. uh, or even sometimes athletes, exercise is vital, movement is vital, but you also have to know that exercise is um, stress, a form of stress. So once we build a muscle or we stress it in some way, then some of that tissue has to come in and heal. And if you do a repetitive movement or repetitive action and you don't give rest, you don't give nutrients where it's needed, you don't properly hydrate, you don't properly rest, then that also starts to break down tissue and deplete someone's energy. So it's all, it's, um, the, the thing I can say the most is I would love someone to move at least 30 minutes a day. Something. I'd love more than that. Like, I move all day. Um, but I think it's better to move small amounts during the day than just to sit all day and then go do a workout for an hour and then go to bed. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, and we're talking about stress too. It's I remember learning about this. There's actually two types of stress. There's good stress and bad stress. Mm-hmm. Good and bad is you know whatever. Sure. Label, but 
There's distress, which is worry and fear, which we've talked about. And I, I think fear is personally one of the biggest killers of, of being a human in general, whether sure. it's happiness or health. Um, so there's, there's distress, not healthy stress, overloaded, not mm-hmm. planning ahead, mm-hmm. not facing the things you're supposed to face. All of those things can create that kind of stress. Then there's you stress, which is a healthy stress. It's challenges. It's sure. the extra push-up. It's the extra five minutes on the walk. And sure. so, um, but there is a, a factor there because if it's not enough, it's not going to have an impact. If it's too much, it's too much. So it seems like, you know, you know me, I'm not a huge fan of the <laughs> balance or moderation or all those things because I do believe that the more we push ourselves, the more we can... Sure. And I mean, that kind of comes from like a coaching athletic perspective of, you know, you do always want to push someone a little bit past their limit to make them grow. And I'm not saying push your limit, but my example there was like, you'll find people that like literally just want to like do crushing workouts like for hours and hours and they're Mm -hmm. in the gym for like three to four hours. Yeah. And when you think about it that way, it's like, that's a lot that's a lot of stress on your body when you're doing hardcore stuff for that long of a period of time but i do believe when you come into the movement part when you come into um the exercise part that absolutely you want to be dynamic the brain loves dynamic it loves moving differently if someone's moving the same way all the time you're not going to challenge it it likes to be challenged Mm -hmm. so yeah if you can do a little bit more if you can do a different type of movement so I like going to classes where I do different things almost every single day. Um, and then I get really good at something, <laughs> and then I, they change it, and I'm really bad at something. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, that's challenging my brain. So, um, you know, the biggest thing I can say is just dynamic movement. So do different things. It's great if you get good at something, but then challenge it with something else um, so that you don't get comfortable and you settle in that comfort and then you just build one muscle, basically. Um, dynamic movement is always key, and that's actually the best thing you can do for your brain. We're gonna get you in one of these hot yoga classes. Hey, so I know <laughs> that uh, it's a little anti your belief system. We'll get you in there one time. So uh, you probably have to go pretty soon because I, I know there's just two more things I, I wanted to pick your brain on. And, Let's do it. and one is because I uh, know you have your your book coming out. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, let's just let's just talk about that for a minute. Sure. I don't want to put it out there too much because it's still a work in process, but it seems it's getting like close. Getting close. Okay, talk a little bit about your book and why, how, when. Yeah. So, um, as you can tell, listeners can probably hear, I do a lot in my practice, um, and God put it on my heart like almost two and a half years ago to write a book, and I know it's honestly just the beginning. There's going to be other things. Um, but I needed a way to, because I, I get so many emails, I get so many questions every week um, of people just looking for answers. And I can only see so many people in a week. Mm-hmm. And I believe that I have been gifted tools and ways to help people. And so I've been trying to put all of this knowledge in a book that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and that's easily readable. But also people feel empowered to be their own doctor. Um, and so, um, as you can guess, it's all about the brain. Um, it's all about enhancing the brain, optimizing the brain. Um, it goes through the three different tiers of healing the body, which is basically how I run my practice, which is taking away any mechanical stress off the body. Um, I talk a lot about airway and cranial work and stuff like that, because that's what I focus on a lot. The second tier is... Um, Uh, enhancing any chemical issues in the body so that the brain and neurological system like what's optimal for the brain what's optimal for the body how do we customize that for someone Um, and then the last part is more a mindset emotional spiritual breakers that limit someone uh, from healing so yeah I'm getting excited it's it's definitely almost ready for editing at this point and it's definitely been a process there's so much research in this book it's ridiculous (laughs) <laughs> a lot of it's going to have to get refined down, but I'm excited because I think it's going to open up people's brains, actually, to... There's a lot of hidden medical... Um, I don't want to say tyranny, but, like, 
There's a lot of hidden medical falsities. And so I'm excited because it's going to start opening people's brains, literally, (laughs) to being like, oh, wow, like, I've never heard that before. But also, here's the research as to why. Okay. Um, So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for people to actually get free in uh, their thoughts and their body and uh, to feel empowered to know how to help others. And who, who's the book for? What kind of a person would go, hey, I, I should pick this up? That's been the, hard, that's, that's been the part that's been harder to market because um, I think it's pretty applicable for, for most anyone just because it's so dynamic. Um, but I'd say anyone who uh, is more open to alternative things um, or wants to level up in their life, wants to get... Um, answers to some difficult questions or symptoms or things that they've been dealing with. Um, And also on the flip side, it can be used for other types of physicians or doctors that may not know that these types of therapies exist and hopefully inspire them to start doing some of those modalities and things as well to help more of their patients as well. Well, that's, you know, you said alternative, and that's one of the things that, that gets me. I, I hear people use the word traditional a lot, and I've been mm-hmm. poking fun at, at folks that are using it because they'll say, well, this is the traditional way of doing things. And I, I'll think, okay, who's tradition? Mm-hmm. Because when you look at, like, the ascent of European nations, that's uh, only a, a couple hundred, few hundred years old. Sure. So, I remember getting a, a Chinese potion, we'll call it, mm-hmm. that was given me by this really cool acupuncturist and his wife would make it and it was one of the greatest like little cocktails of of feel good that ever had and for them that's totally. traditional but it was a couple thousand years old yeah we say alternative medicine when some of these things have been around for thousands of years absolutely and we call something traditional it's been around for 50 years so appreciate uh what you're doing in terms of the work out there and helping people get a better grasp on their own personal health and glad yeah that you, uh, came by and we'll have to do this again it's the the first official one so oh, where can people find you find your book give yourself yeah, a plug sure uh so i'm on facebook and instagram um and on twitter so it's just dr rachel hamill uh, actually i think it's dr rachel i switched it um but i have a, a absolutely free blog and um i also have a free ebook so people can sign up through that on my website drrachelhamill.com um, and they can just reach out to me that way. That's awesome. And I guess because, uh, one last question for you. <laughs> so uh, you, you only exist in one place. You're here in San Diego. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would somebody find someone like yourself? What kind of keywords would they type? I mean, how do they, let's say they live in Boise, Idaho or St. George, Utah or, you know, Alabama. <laughs> how are they going to find someone like you to start down this path of, of self-care and, and healing? Yeah, that's part of why I'm writing the book is to bridge that gap. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, like the nutritional part that I do is actually genetic based nutrition and that can be done virtually, which is pretty cool. But we have um, a big group of actual genetic nutrition specialists so people can I'll look for someone near them. Uh, it's called holistic methylation, so they can look up those types of practitioners. Um, they can also reach out to me, and I can see if there's people within their community um, that I know. You know, there's not many craniopaths, but there are still some good physicians. Look for functional medicine doctors. Um, uh, if you are struggling or haven't found answers, and just look for someone who's more open-minded to think and ask you more questions about what's going on. And uh, there's lots of resources out there. Well, that is awesome. I know I said someone like you. There really is nobody <laughs> quite like you. So uh, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for, all thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's been a ton of fun.